They are elected by you, I am elected by you. I'm constrained as they are constrained by a system that our founders put in place. The founders separated power because they knew it was the best way to protect our citizens. They didn't want one person, one man to have all the power like a king. We show by our work that free people can govern themselves. You can't pay lip service to the Constitution without obeying it. Keep your eye on the ball. Structure is uh, structure is destiny. This is Necessary and Proper, the podcast of the Federal Society's Article One Initiative. All views expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Society. Hi, this is Nate Kazmarek, and I am the director of the Federal Society's Article One Initiative. On this episode, we are delighted to bring you a recording of a recent event at one of our student chapters with Congressman Thomas Massey from Kentucky. On September 4th, FedSoc student chapter president Sebastian Torres of Northern Kentucky University Chase Law School welcomed Congressman Massey for a discussion of the committee process, the two-party system, the Department of Education, the Liberty Caucus, and much more. We hope you like it. Please send us your feedback at article I at fedsoc.org. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Congressman Massey. Congressman Massey is the congressman of the 4th District, which stretches essentially from Ashland, Kentucky, all the way west to what point? Jefferson County. Jefferson County. So um, Congressman Massey and his time in Frankfurt since 2012 has been an advocate for limited government. Uh as a member of the House Liberty Caucus and and uh, really shaking things up, you may have recently seen his documentary. Well, the documentary that he was featured in called "The Swamp," where he talks about his time in uh, in Washington D.C. So, with that, I'd like to introduce Congressman Massey. I identify with everything he said except Frankfurt. I uh, work in Washington D.C. Did I say Frankfurt? Yes, that's all right. Uh, <laughs> So that's, that's the, the small swamp, and the big swamp is in D.C., which is where I work. I will be flying there today and voting tonight. Uh, and it's, a, it's kind of weird to be going back to D.C. today because we've been in recess for about five weeks, I think. So it's kind of like going back to school. You're going to see how everybody else has changed, and uh, they're, they're all going to have tans and new haircuts and uh, – it's just going to be weird to walk on the floor after being gone for five weeks. It's always it's always that way. Uh, Sebastian talked about a show called The Swamp. It's a series on the Internet. Has anybody here seen that? Okay, so like seven or so folks have seen that. I encourage you to watch that. These are like 12-minute segments, uh, maybe 15-minute segments. And the producer just texted me on my way in. They want to film some more segments. Um, they've got more funding to do this. They're producing a show about the inside of Washington, D.C., and they call it The Swamp. And I've been on two of the segments. One of them has 8 million views on Facebook, which is the only place they've hosted it so far. And in, I think the reason it has so many views is because I spoke so frankly about what actually goes on there and how the committee process works. Uh, last year, or the year before, I talked about the committee process here, and I may get into that a little bit, but you may be under the illusion that when you go to Congress that you get a committee that's based on things you know about. For instance, you would go on the Judicial Committee if you had been a judge in a prior life, or uh, if you were a doctor, you would go on the, on the committee that has, to, that has the jurisdiction over health and human services. Or if you were an accountant, maybe you would go on the Tax Committee when you get to Congress. That is not how it works. It's, it doesn't resemble that at all. Uh, the committees are ranked in terms of desirability. The most desirable committee is the one where the lobbyists want to give the most money to you when you get on that committee. And that's how they rank the desirability of the committees. The way you get on a committee is you raise a lot of money and you give it to your party. And then you're, depending on how much money you can raise, not just once but annually, your party will give you a more desirable committee. And again, desirability is not based on the needs of your district. It's based on how lucrative that committee would be for you in terms of fundraising. So it's kind of this weird, vicious cycle, and I exposed that on this show called The Swamp. It has 8 million views. It's pretty shocking. And after 8 million views, not a single person 
has disputed any word I say in there. So that should be eye-opening. Uh, in Congress, I tell people I'm not so much bipartisan as I am transpartisan. Now, tra that's a word I came up with. It means I can't identify with either party some days. I don't know which cloakroom to go into. Uh, but uh, it's, it is difficult. When I got to Congress, I wondered, could there ever be a third party? You know, this is always something you think about, particularly if you study politics. And when I got to Congress, I realized that the two-party system is built into the architecture. Like, there's an aisle down the middle where they talk about the right side of the aisle and the left side of the aisle. But there are two cloakrooms on the floor of the House of Representatives, right behind the floor. There aren't three. There, there isn't one. There are two cloakrooms. And in every committee hearing room, there are two back rooms. So if you can imagine in this room, it's about the size of a small community hearing room here. There would be a room over there and a room over there where you could go get coffee, hang up your coat, and uh, talk to your staff. And there are always two rooms. There aren't three. There's not one room. There's always two back rooms. And yes, they call them back rooms. And yes, they do deals in the back rooms. And yes, sometimes they have smoke in them. Um, <laughs> Sebastian correctly uh, noted that I'm in the Liberty Caucus. I am not in the Freedom Caucus. Has anybody ever heard of the Freedom Caucus? Sure, if you so the Freedom Caucus is a voting block. Uh, this is there's a little bit of game theory that goes with Congress. It's not just show up and vote your conscience, or show up and vote for what your district needs, uh, or show up and vote for the things that are constitutional that we can afford that the federal government should be doing instead of the state government. It does I'll, I'll, sometimes. It's more uh, gamesmanship, and uh, what the Freedom Caucus is, is a voting block. So it's a group of members of Congress who say, we're going to go to the floor of the House of Representatives, and we're all going to vote the same way. And as long as we don't break ranks, as long as we're arm in arm, if we have enough people, we can control the discussion on the floor of the House of Representatives. So you'll see this in caucuses, caucuses that form and then vow to vote a certain way. Uh, it's, you know, we've only, I told you we've only got two parties in Congress, but really there are about six parties. It's, you know, in Europe, in the Parliament, they have multiple parties and they form coalitions. That's still going on in Congress, even though you have to have an R or a D beside your name. There's still coalitions forming that can control the, the discussion. So the Freedom Caucus has about 30 to 40 members, and the Republicans have a majority of 24. So if the Freedom Caucus, which is made up uniformly of Republicans, decides to break ranks with the Speaker of the House, then they, and the Speaker of the House doesn't have any Democrat votes on the bill, then the Freedom Caucus can take the bill down, or so to speak. Uh, so that's just a little bit about Congress and the way things work and what I'm going to be returning to tonight. By the way, tonight we're going to be like renaming post offices. I know that's a cliche, but we do name post offices. Uh, we do that on fly-in nights because you wouldn't have a bill, you wouldn't have a vote to repeal Obamacare on a night like tonight because somebody's plane might get delayed and they would lose their election, you know, because their constituents expected them either to be there, darn it, and vote for it or against it. So tonight, it's mostly just naming post offices and whatnot. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some current topics, Kavanaugh, Kavanaugh's confirmation. By the way, I had, uh, I had a lot of constituents call me and demand that I, I vote against Betsy DeVos's confirmation. But the problem with that, yeah, here's Sebastian laughing, is uh, the House of Representatives does not vote on confirmations. The Senate does that. So they have advised and consent uh, responsibilities according to the Constitution. We do not. So we tried explaining to constituents who called. My staff would say, he's in the House, so he's, he's not going to be voting on that. And some of the more adamant constituents would say, that's just an excuse. We know he can stop her confirmation. He needs to do something. So... <clears throat> On the day they voted on her confirmation, I texted my friend Rand Paul and I said, are you, are you voting right now? And he said, yes, right now. So I went to the floor of the House of Representatives 
and, and introduced into the hopper a one-line bill that says, the Department of Education shall terminate on December 31st, 2018. So now when they call and say, what are you doing to stop Betsy DeVos? I'm, I'm trying to get her fired. <laughs> <laughs> Which set me up for an awkward moment once at the White House where I met her. <laughs> In fact, I was there with my 14-year-old daughter. I'll tell you more about that later. And... Uh, so I'm introducing my daughter to Betsy DeVos, you know, good role model for, for a young lady like my daughter. And uh, I, before Betsy DeVos, she kind of looked at me and I was like, oh, no, she probably knows I'm that guy. So uh, I broke the ice first and said, look, it's nothing personal. I just don't think your department needs to exist at the federal level. Uh, and she actually didn't take it personally. She was OK with that. Uh uh, another another current event or topic that's going on, and this is this is in the courts. I mean, as so much of these <coughs> legislative issues are today, there's an issue in the courts I want to talk about. And at first, it seems like a Second Amendment issue, and and some of you may not be uh, interested in it for that reason. But it's actually a very uh, interesting issue in terms of how laws get uh, formed. I won't say past, but how laws come into being. And uh, it's also about the First Amendment. It's not really about the Second Amendment. So this is the case of the 3D printed gun. Uh, in I think it was 2013. It was about five years ago. A guy named Cody Wilson, who was 25 years old at the time, printed a, a gun, made a YouTube of him shooting it. So it's a first known example of a gun that was printed on a 3D printer and shot and fired. Uh, I think it like fell apart when it happened, and you know, but he didn't get hurt, <laughs> anyways. Uh, but it was it's an interesting test case because uh, 3D printers are going to get better and better. And right now, it's just a test case because nobody in their right mind who wants to defend themselves or their families or even start an insurrection would print out a gun on an available 3D printer. It's also not an economical way to do it, uh, but it's an interesting test case. And so there's no law preventing what he did. In fact, it is legal for you, not on campus, but back at your house, to uh, manufacture your own firearm. You don't have to have a license to do that. Uh, you don't have to put a serial number on it. As long as you never sell it, you can manufacture. So that's, that's the case law. That's clear. That's, uh, that's known. That's in the legislation. So he didn't do anything illegal, but he did something very interesting because he put the files on the Internet of the 3D gun. And he put some other files of other guns and gun accessories. And he caught the attention of, of the world, but also John Kerry, the Secretary of State. Uh, what they chose to do is to try and stop him not using a, a gun control law that applies to U.S. citizens, but using uh, the Arms Export Control Act. So the Secretary of State said, uh, you are violating the Arms Export Control Act, the International Trade in Arms Regulations, because what you're doing is enabling people in other countries who may be hostile to our country to create a firearm. Now, these, these laws are meant to prevent the export of designs for, like, centrifuges for enriching uranium or for how to detonate a nuclear bomb. Like, that's what these laws are meant to do, but they tried to say it applies to this 3D printed gun. And so he, he complied, he took down his website, and he sued them. He's got a very good lawyer who I'm, I'm personally familiar with his lawyer, Alan Gura, who won two the two most consequential Second Amendment cases in, in front of the Supreme Court ever, and, in the, and certainly in the last couple decades, he, Alan Gura is the lawyer who won the Heller decision, which was the D.C. case that uh, affirmed that the Second Amendment doesn't apply to militias, it applies to people. It doesn't apply to militias only because it says the people, the right of the people. It applies to people. Now, because that case was in Washington, D.C., it had no bearing on the states. Uh, which, so it's, it's, it's interesting, 
Uh, as you folks probably know, if you're law students, the Bill of Rights was not intended to restrict the states. It did not apply to the states until the uh, 13th Amendment and then subsequent actions of the uh, courts have incorporated the Bill of Rights to, this is called the Incorporation Doctrine, to apply to the states. So the First Amendment, I think, was the first Bill of Rights that got incorporated in like the 1920s. I, somebody in here knows the case. What, uh, what was it? Gitlow, that's it. The Gitlow decision. Um, and so that was the first one. That's a guy who's either passed or going to pass his bar exam. I don't know about the rest <laughs> of you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, so the Second Amendment had never been incorporated until uh, McDonald versus Chicago. So after the Heller decision, which was like in 2008, I think in 2010. The same lawyer, Alan Gura, who's like in his 40s, won his second Supreme Court case on the Second Amendment. And it was in it was in Chicago. So now the Second Amendment, which had never applied to the states, now applies to the states as a result of the McDonald decision. So Alan Gura took up Cody Wilson's case uh, on these 3D printed guns. OK, fast forward. I'll try to speed this up. But I thought this would be interesting to a lot of folks who are interested in Congress and the way laws are, are made and the way courts work and how it has, what bearing that has on laws and also the state versus the federal issues. But um, so the Secretary of State is now Mike Pompeo. He's, he used to be a congressman. I used to sit next to him. And there's no assigned seating in Congress. You just sit wherever you want, but it's really clickish. You just it's like high school cafeteria or church pews. The same people sit in the same place with the same other people all the time. When I go back to Congress tonight, I know there's like about 20 seats. I'm going to be, one of them I'm going to be sitting in because my friends will be sitting in the other seats. Uh, but uh, anyways, Mike Pompeo is now secretary of state and he was advised from the Department of Justice that if you pursue this case against Cody Wilson, you're going to lose. Like, because here's what Cody Wilson's doing. He's putting files on the Internet that are legal for me to give you here today. I could, I could pass out a thumb drive to every one of you and with the files that he had put on the Internet. And the government really has no problem with that. Uh, so what they were saying is you are sharing speech that you can share in this country, but because you put it on the Internet, it's now illegal to share this speech. So that's why it's a First Amendment issue <coughs> as much as it is a Second Amendment issue. And so this, uh, the DOJ told the State Department, drop this case, you're going to lose it. Cody Wilson's going to beat you like a drum. And so, and oh, by the way, the State Department doesn't want to be a secondary ATF. We're not, we don't want to, they decided they didn't want to become a gun regulation institution. So they dropped the case and they paid Cody Wilson's lawyer's fees, $40,000. Not all of them, but some of them. And, and they gave him a whole list of files he could put on the internet. It's not even ambiguous. He could put AR 15s up there, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he was going to, in August, he was going to be able to put all these files back on the internet. By the way, you can go on the internet and find these files. Like, He's just the one they're picking on, and there's no way to stop the flow of information. You could go to Bermuda and put them on a website, right, and then download them from here in the United States. There's, there's no way they can block this. So he was going to put them back up, but some uh, state attorneys general and other interested parties sued him in lower courts and have an injunction, so now he can't put them on his webpage and, uh, until this injunction is, is settled. So it's just that's an interesting case that you might want to follow. What Cody Wilson just decided to do last week is like, well, if I can't be the Napster of 3D printed guns, I'll be the iTunes of 3D printed guns. So he's selling the, de the designs and you can pick your own price and you could pay him anywhere between a penny and ten dollars, whatever you feel like. For the design, you have to affirm that you're a U.S. citizen living in the United States before he emails you the file in a secure, you know, format. 
So that's where that case stands now. And it, it reminds me of another case. I have a bill to legalize raw milk. Uh, as we've been with humans have been consuming raw milk for thousands of years. But the federal government will arrest you if you facilitate the interstate transportation of raw milk, even from a state where it's legal to a state where it's legal. Most food laws are set up by the state, you know, the states. Uh, but the federal government has, will and has raided farmers for selling raw milk. Uh, and, it, you know, like they send somebody in and say, you do know I'm taking this raw milk across the state line. You do know I'm from, you know, Tennessee. And the farmer says, oh, I don't care what you do with it, you know, pour it out, feed it to your dog, take a bath in it. Well, uh, as soon as he sells the milk, now he's in trouble. So uh, I've got a bill to legalize the interstate transport of raw milk between two states where it's legal. It doesn't seem like a giant leap of like freedom or liberty. It seems like common sense. But the milk lobby came after me when I introduced this bill. See, it's controlled. You've got to follow the money. And they want to be all things milk. And so farmers don't sell milk to consumers right now. That's... That's something they want to prevent. So farmers sell their milk to a cooperative or to or they contract with one of these big companies, and then the big company brands it, sends it through Kroger's or whatever, and so that's how, how milk gets distributed. They felt threatened. So they, they came after me personally. Like the day I introduced this bill with 20-some 20, 20 sponsors, they said that people were going to die, kids would perish, <coughs> kidneys would fail. And all the blood would be on my hands. <laughs> this is hard stuff to read, right? My Google alerts are going off. Like, you know, whoa, that's me they're talking about. Oh, well, my wife also has Google alerts on me. And um, she's like, whoa, that's, that's mean stuff. And, and she texted me. She said, OMG, I didn't realize the lactose lobby was so intolerant. <laughs> uh, they are very intolerant. But there is no law banning raw milk. There is no federal law. Here's how this regulation came into being. There were some interested parties who wanted the, uh, I think it's the FDA that regulates it, not the USDA. But they wanted the FDA to use their powers to regulate it. And they said, you know what? There's so few people that drink raw milk, and of those who do, there's so few illnesses. This is not worth our time and expense. And oh, by the way, the state governments do this already. They manage this issue. And so the FDA refused to regulate raw milk. And uh, somebody sued them in court, like an interested group. I think it was actually Ralph Nader's group that sued them and as a result of the settlement, they agreed to ban raw milk. So that's how, that's how there's a law against raw milk. Now, they're, uh, they have the authority to ban uh, milk that's adulterated. So kind of like the 3D printer case where the Secretary of State had the authority to stop the export of uranium enrichment, you know, <laughs> centrifuges, designs and nuclear weapon designs, uh, the FDA contorted this law that keeps people from mixing like other things with milk and selling it. Uh, they contorted the law to apply to raw milk. So it's interesting how some of these things become laws. Uh, we had one of the one of the neat things about being a congressman is you get to meet neat people. And a few years ago I got to have breakfast with Antonin Scalia. There were uh, about 12 of us congressmen who invited him over for breakfast. And the topic, my colleague Steve King from Iowa was the one who invited him. And his, the topic he was supposed to speak on was restoring constitutional balance of government. In other words, the executive branch is out of control. The courts are out of control. How does Congress, you know, how, how is the Supreme Court going to help us restore the balance of constitutional balance of authority. And Scalia, he, he picked up the flyer for the breakfast, 
and, and after he had finished his breakfast, and he looked at it, he dropped it, and he looked at us, he's like, guys, this is not my job. My job is not to restore constitutional balance of power. And somebody said, well, if you don't, who will? And he said, you guys have all the tools you need in the Constitution. And one of my colleagues says, but impeachment is so unwieldy. It's like politically impossible to carry out. And Scalia kind of scoffed at that and said, I am not talking about impeachment. You guys have the power of the purse. Everything you complain about, you are funding. All you have, all you have to do is stop funding it. And, I mean, my colleagues sort of know that, but they had to be reminded by Supreme Court justice that that is the case. And so uh, that was just one little interesting uh, exchange I had. Before I open it up for questions, I want to tell you the rest of the story about how my daughter met Betsy DeVos and where I had to disclose that I actually was trying to get rid of her job and her old department. By the way, there are uh, 400, let's see, you know, 4,000 Federal Department of Education employees. And they make an average of $100,000 a year. Multi multiply that out, it's uh, $400 million a year of, of salaries for the U.S. Department, Federal Department of Education. So I think that money could be put to better use here in the States. Let Joe Fisher spend it. <laughs> Who's, by the way, what's that? Put, a, put up a bridge. Yeah. Put up, or a bridge, yeah. Joe Fisher's ready to build. This, this is your uh, Campbell County State Representative Joe Fisher, who I uh, think needs to be recognized. Uh, who's on the ball on a lot of this stuff down in, in Frankfurt. He is in Frankfurt. Um, <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, the reason my daughter uh, was at the White House is the kids in her school, she goes to public school, she's 14, wanted to know, has she ever met President Trump? And she had never met President Trump, so I was trying to facilitate a meeting between my daughter and the president, and so there's this Christmas party where the president always has a, a Christmas party for Congress. And it's sort of this charm offensive. You're supposed to go over to the White House and get wowed and wooed and, and eat some good food, and then maybe you'll be friendlier to the president. I think it's not a bad idea. It's also you have senators and representatives. There aren't very many bicameral events in, in Congress. That, and you also have Republicans and Democrats all at the White House floating around but you can only have one guest. So instead of bringing my wife, she said I could bring my daughter, which was a big deal. So uh, my daughter practiced shaking my hand for three days <laughs> just because she had she'd never shaken a man's hand, let alone, like, let alone the president's hand, and she did not want to screw this up. Uh, now, I forgot he doesn't really like to shake hands. That's why he does this when you walk up. Uh, but she caught him off guard. <laughs> it was our turn to talk to him. She grabbed his hand. While she's still shaking his hand, she looked him in the eye and said, Mr. President, could you make school lunches great again? <laughs> uh, and then this summer, which, by the way, there was never any law. It was just like an initiative to clamp down on sodium requirements or sodium uh, allowances in school lunches. And some other things, uh, the the wheat you have to have whole grain, whole wheat or whatever, and so it's made the food like kind of unpalatable. And she just wanted a little more sodium. So uh, what they did this summer, they actually relaxed some of the requirements on school lunches. So I'm going to give my daughter credit for that. <laughs> but now she's a lobbyist. <laughs> so, anyways, with that, I think I'll open it up to questions. Uh, we'll begin with a couple of questions from our advisor, Eric Alden, relating to the Article 1 initiative. Okay, right, sounds thanks. good. Concerning the Article 1 duties and responsibilities assigned to the legislative branch by the framers, what troubles you most about how the Congress is currently operating? Mm. I would say the power to declare war, uh, which Madison, you can, even Washington, George Washington, but... Uh, Madison warned about giving the executive branch the power to go to war because they would get the most credit. It's, that's when they get their laurels. 
Everybody, when, when the president becomes commander in chief, I mean, look at the approval ratings for the military versus, you know, Washington, D.C. Your approval ratings go through the roof once you're part of the military instead of. And, and if you're undertaking a campaign of war, who can withhold their support? That would be unpatriotic. Right. So uh, Madison knew it was dangerous to let the executive branch have the power to declare war, which is why they vested it in Congress. It's one of the Article One powers. And it's the one that we have let atrophy. It's the one I, I w- I've been on TV. CNN loves to have me on or MSNBC whenever I disagree with the president. Like it's a, it's a trap. I know it's a trap. <laughs> but it's kind of like as long as it's live TV, I'll get in the ring and box with them. Uh, even though it's like Mayweather versus Mayhew or whatever, like you know you're going to get your butt kicked because it's their rules. It's worth getting in there and throwing a few punches. And uh, on this issue, like when the president sent missiles into Syria, uh, and, and before this president was president, we were, according to the Washington Post, we were funding a covert war in Syria. And... Um, <clears throat> So that's the one that bothers me the most. We're uh, facilitating the Saudis in their war in Yemen, refueling their planes and providing munitions. Uh, we're all over the place. And I, I have literally asked without a good answer in, in, a, in a closed room, the Secretary of State, like I challenged them on this, like where did they find the authority in the Constitution to – to do what they had done because they were giving us a briefing on Syria. You know, where did the missiles hit and how much damage was caused? And and it was a classified, I mean, this was in a classified setting, but all of the House of Representatives was there. And when they opened the microphones, I was the first one at the mic and I asked them this. And uh, they say that it's derived from the, the diplomacy clause that the president can, under you know, he, he, he is the one who facilitates diplomacy and that this is a form of diplomacy. Uh, So my follow-up question was, what are the bounds? Where are your boundaries? Like, uh, and could you tomorrow strike North Korea uh, without approval, prior approval from Congress? And uh, that's when they they said, okay, your time's expired, next question. Like, Because it was the, like the chairman of the armed services who was like the moderator there, and they didn't want me to pursue that any further. But that's the that's the Article One power that concerns me the most. Because now, once you're in a war, what? How can you withhold support? And it almost always escalates. The same thing with the trade war. So the first uh, tariff that the president imposed was was done under his authority. Uh, uh, to, to protect the national defense. You know, steel is an important uh, component of our military. I say, well, if the Chinese are selling us steel at below cost, let's, let's hurry up and build some aircraft carriers with that stuff, and they're subsidizing our military. Uh, but, so, you know, the president said, well, under my authority to uh, provide for national security, and Congress did did give him that authority uh, because they didn't want it. That's the theme you'll see here. The reason we're not voting on these the the AUMF for Afghanistan will be 18 years old next year, which means there are soldiers going to deploy to Afghanistan next Afghanistan next year who were born after the war started. That's never happened in our history. But the reason that's happening and the reason we can't get a vote on the floor. The House of Representatives isn't necessarily, I've discovered, because Paul Ryan and Nancy Pelosi won't let it happen. It's because the members are going to them and saying, don't let this happen. We don't want to go on the record on this. We're going to, so uh, that's the case. And in the case of the trade wars, it was, it was started with the national security you know, umbrella. And now the second wave of tariffs is the president's allowed to retaliate without coming to Congress if somebody tariffs our products. So now we're in this, it's already escalated. And the founding fathers, speaking of Article One, they put the power to tax 
not just in the Congress and the legislative branch, only the House of Representatives has the power to tax. So, which is the largest body, which is also reelected every two years and, and by a popular vote, uh, they never intended for the president to be able to pass a tax. And, and, you know, if you wanted to replace the income tax with a flat tariff, I could be persuaded that taxing uh, consumption of foreign goods is no less evil, is no more evil than taxing your labor. And so I could be persuaded that maybe that's the way to go. The founding fathers, 90% of our revenue for the first 100 years of this country was from tariffs. But the problem we're in right now is now you got the executive branch picking winners and losers and raising and lowering taxes on their own. The way they pick winners and losers is they decide which segment of the industry needs needs support and which, which industries don't. And now I'm being bombarded by uh, constituents who have companies in this region, uh, one in particular, who are, who are applying for an exemption to the tariff. You see, you can get exemptions, but the only one that can hand out the hall passes is the executive branch. But they, they still think Congress has something to do with it. So they come to us and, and ask us to lobby the uh, Secretary uh, Wilbur Ross to get their exemption. So then you're picking winners and losers on the front end and on the back end. And all that stuff should is Article 1. It should be in Congress, whether it's war or whether it's tariffs. All right. Second question. You are not supportive of the most recent omnibus spending bill. Can you explain why? And how would you like to see the appropriations and budget process changed? Uh, we just need to follow our own rules. <laughs> We're not supposed to do an omnibus. There isn't supposed to be like one button or one vote that funds everything or funds nothing. But I've discovered, again, they kind of like it this way in Congress because uh, they can put a lot of bad stuff in there. And then congressmen have cover when they come back to their districts to an event like this and stand up. And somebody says, well, if you believe that, why did you vote for that? That was in the omnibus. They, they shrug and they say, I had a binary choice, either fund everything, which includes the roads and the schools and the, you know, and NASA and the national monuments and the military pay. Certainly you wanted me to pay for all that, didn't you? Because my only choice was to pay for that and the bad stuff or to pay for none of it. And so they, they get a pass. Congress gets a pass when it's an omnibus. The other thing, and this is this is an interesting thing, I, I would think, for the Federalist Society, is uh, the president has, has asked for a line item veto. Now, the the Supreme Court, the Congress already tried that. The Supreme Court already ruled it out, you know, shut it down. Said you can't give up power. Well, this is funny, but they said you can't give up power that's yours that way to the executive branch. Uh, and but if we did separate appropriations bills. See, we're supposed to, our rules say we're supposed to do 12 separate bills. If you did 12 separate bills and the president or the Senate had an issue with one of the 12, they could block that 12th of the government without shutting down the 11, other 11 twelfths of the government. And, and the president wouldn't need a line item veto. He would just, if he wanted funding for the wall and... When we pass the appropriations bill that funds the Department of Homeland Security, if the wall wasn't in there, he could veto that instead of vetoing, having to <clears throat> veto all spending. And so that's what we need to do. We need to get back to debating and amending and, and voting on separate appropriations bills. Now, Congress has, has actually done a lot better job of that this year. The, this Speaker of the House did not allow amendments even amendments that were germane to the spending and especially amendments that would cut spending. He would not allow any of us to offer amendments. I, he, under John Boehner, who, under who I, I chomped at the bit and you know, shaped me a little bit to serve with John Boehner, but Paul Ryan has been worse uh, in terms of allowing rank-and-file members to have uh, input into various bills. I, I've had one vote on the floor of the House this Congress since since Paul Ryan was speaker. Under John Boehner, I was able to get at least uh, eight or a dozen 
uh, pieces of legislation to the floor for a vote. Thank you for listening to Necessary and Proper. If you enjoyed this podcast, please tell a friend and don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play. To learn more about the Article 1 initiative, please visit fedsoc.org slash article I. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash article I. This has been a FedSoc audio production.